At this point, we want to start looking at a second way to synthesize logic circuits, and that is using a canonical product of sums approach. So a canonical sum appro product of sums approach is where you use an approach that's very similar to the canonical sum of products approach, except that you do everything as the complement or the dual. So what that means is that if you remember our original example, so let's take a look at an, an example of a midterm list, so, or a midterm approach. So I have AB 00011011, and let's say that we, we desired to create a system that looked like this. So we want an output that had 0110. So we have the row number over here, we have 0123, and what we did with min terms was we wrote a min term for each output that corresponded to an output of a 1. So we had a min term for row 1, min term for row 2, and they were simply product terms that included every variable and, and had inversions on them that made them assert for only one and only one input code. So we had these min terms and then we simply ORed them together and we had a sum of products. So when we go to a product of sums, we are going to use the dual of this approach and what we are going to do is we're going to create circuits which produce the zeros. So we are actually going to do a similar approach, but we're going to look at trying to create the zeros, and then by default, if we don't do anything, we'll have ones. Okay, so the analog to a min term is going to be what we call a max term. And a max term has the following behaviors. First of all, it is a sum term. The second one is that it includes all input variables. And then the final thing is that it will produce a zero for one and only one input code. So it's kind of the dual of a min term. So what this is going to look like is we are going to have an OR gate, which we're going to insert inversions on the input variables a and B, for example, in order to get this to produce a zero for one and only one input code. Now, let's take a look at how we could write this. So let's go. Let's come over here and let me let me redraw our true table so we can put in the max term this time. So I'm going to have A, B, and F, and what I'm going to do is say zero 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 one one zero one one, and I'll have zero one one zero. And what I want to do is I'm going to write a max term for row zero, so we'll call this row zero, and I'm going to give it a capital M subscript zero this time. And then down here for row three, I'm going to give it a capital M subscript three. And that kind of, di that differentiates it from the max, or from the min term, which you use lowercase. And at this point, what we're going to do then is write the sum term. So the sum term is going to have each and every variable in it. So this max term is going to start with A or with B. But it's only going to produce a zero or not be asserted for one and only one input code. So if you look at this right now, it will produce a zero for A is equal to zero and B is equal to zero. Any other input code would cause it to be a 1. So for example, if I input 0 and 1 into this thing, B would be a 1, so it would be asserted. Same thing if I put in the input code for row 2, 1, 0, then A would be asserted, the output would be a 1. And then if I put in 1 and 1, you would have 1 ordered with 1, that would be a 1. So in, in reality, this is the correct max term for row 0. Now, here's the way that you really think about it that makes it a little bit easier. Whenever you see the input code be a zero, you leave the input variable uncomplemented. So for this example, A was a zero and B was a zero, so both of them were uncomplemented. Let's take a look at how that compares when we went back and did our min term. Notice that on a min term what we did was anytime we had an input code variable or an input variable that had a code of a zero, we complemented the input variable. And every time we had an input variable that was a one for this code, we left it uncomplemented. So over here we had 0 and 1 on the input code, so the min term for that was A not B. 
and on this one we had an input code of 1, 0, so the min term was A, B naught. Over here what we do is we only, if the input codes are zeros, we don't complement them. We leave the variable uncomplemented. So for this, A was a zero and B was a zero, so A was uncomplemented, B was uncomplemented. So let's extend that now to the max term for row three. We're going to have a max term, which is a sum term which contains each input variable, and now we're going to put the, in, the inversions on this so that this max will produce a zero for one and only one input code. So what I have to do here is my input variable is a one for A, so I'm going to complement it, and then over here the input variable is a one for B, so I'm going to complement that. So now if you, if you look at that, what we're going to have is I'm going to have an OR gate for max term zero, and I'll label its, its node M0, and it's going to have A and B in here. And then I'm going to have A and B down here, and I'm going to have inversions on both of them. So now I have this, and I have max term three. And let's, let's go ahead and put in some test cases right here, and let's run through it. So let's put in the codes zero, zero. So zero and zero on this max term is going to be or together, and it will produce a zero. Down here, zero and zero is going to be inverted, and so you'll get a one and a one into this, and it will output a one. So that this is the situation for input code uh, zero zero. Now is that behaving correctly? It is behaving correctly because min or max term zero created a zero for that input code, and this one down here created a one for it. So that was saying I didn't produce a zero for that input code. So let's now go along, and that was when you had input codes zero and zero. Let's make it look kind of like a little table here. And then let's do input codes 0 and 1. So now what we're going to have is we've got 0 and 1. So if you think about it, now we have 0 and 1 on these inputs. The output's going to be a 1. So the output's going to be a 1 because anytime you have a 1 on an OR gate, its output's a 1. Down here, again, we'll have 0 and 1. We will have the 0 will be complemented. It'll become a 1. And then the 1 will be complemented, it'll become a 0. But it doesn't matter because one of them was a 1. So anytime you have a 1 on an OR gate, put as one. So now, did those behave the way we wanted them to? I'm going to put just commas there to separate them. And in fact, they did. The, this max term produced a zero for only this zero, zero input code. And when it got the code zero, one, it produced a one. That's what it was supposed to do. Same thing with max term three, it produced a one. Okay, so let's go with one and zero. So one and zero comes into, now we're on this, this row of the true table. So max term zero comes along and it sees one zero. Well, of course, the output's going to be a one because anytime you have a one on an OR gate, the output's a one. Same thing down here. You have a one and a zero. Well, one of them's going to be complemented. Both of them are going to be complemented, so a one zero becomes a zero one. Doesn't matter because anytime you have a one on an OR gate, you have an output of a one. So let's look at the final code, which is one one. Up here, you have one and one OR together. Of course, that's going to have an output of one. That's what that max term should have done. Down here, though, finally, we get to a situation where the 1 and the 1 came in. It was complemented to produce a 0 and a 0 at the inputs of the OR gate. It finally produced a 0. So you can see the behavior of these max terms where this code right here, 0, 0, caused the max term to produce a 0. In all other situations, it produced a 1. Down here, it was this code right here for max term 3 that produced the 0. And for all other input codes, it produced a 1. So now what do we do with these max terms? Well, all we need to do now is we need to take them and run them into a product term that produces the output. Now let's think about what happens here. Whenever you have a product term that has a 1 and a 1 on it, or all the inputs are 1s, it'll produce a 1. So in this situation, it was these two codes right here that produced a 1. And those two codes right there, so these codes right here, corresponded to these codes right here in the true table. So that was the outputs of a 1. And then what we did is when, when the max term for M0 saw the input code 00, it pulled, it pulled the, its, its max term value down, which for then produced a 0 on the AND gate, and that pulled the output down. So that's what handle that row. And then finally, when we get to the input code 1, 1, up here, notice that it pulled M3 down to a 0. 
and then the zero on the input to the product term caused the output to go to a zero. So that's how you handled this final, this final uh, row. So the actual, if I clean this up and drew what it actually looks like, it looks like this. It looks like two max terms, which are sum terms, and they go into a product term. And then I'll just draw the inverters on here just to make it, just to draw it a little bit different. So I have in zero and zero come in, and I have A inverted, and I have B inverted. And that is now my canonical product of sums. Notice that the product of sums come from that I had a product term that took the product of a whole bunch of sum terms. So that's where the product of, product of sums uh, terminology comes from.